All right. Hello, everyone. My name is Kenan Kikinda, and I am going to be talking about bad writing or developing a complex orthography through the tale of writing in Zevi. So I am very happy to be going after Cheryl because this seeks right into that. And so a quick history of Zevi writing. The symbols of Zevi writing are the ones shown here. And at another time, I'll talk about how these came to be the symbols. But for now, what I'm talking about is everything that happened afterwards. And so early in Zevi writing, there was a very strong one-to-one -one sound correspondence between the symbols and what you were writing. If you were a scribe writing before the printing press at the time where writing was all about individuals deciding what they wanted to lay down, you might want to write about a boring shoe in a brown box. And so in Zevi, it's a very head final language. So the order is a little bit different, but in general, you'd pick the words that you wanted to use. You would put down the sounds, which as a scribe you knew corresponded to those. So if you were a scribe in one of the dialects, you might be saying, te sube daka verbod. And you would just string together all of the symbols which correspond to those sounds. And so one of the things about this is it's very straightforward right off the bat, but you have the issue that a scribe in a different dialect near to you might be writing down different sounds. So they might say teizu instead of teizu, or they might say dakka. Um, and so um, the early system had this huge variance, this huge personal variance, this huge dialect of their variance. And just as another example of this, which is mostly relevant for comparison with what we see in the modern writing, this is the way that a scribe would put down in the square under the circle. So you fast forward by a few hundred years, a ton of developments, and you get the modern Zevi writing system instead. So there's no longer this one-to-one -one sound correspondence. Instead, you have a rather complex sound correspondence where things have been mixed up through fossilization of certain affixes and these ligatures which have been introduced, these years of sound changes, these spatial abbreviations, ways that, um, the standardized system has chose to disambiguate homophones and ways that unstressed vowels have been deleted. And so this is what we'll be diving through throughout this talk. So you can see that at this point, modern Zebi writing is a rather deep orthography, but stepping back into what that means in a more general context. So in a speech, speakers generally are aware of these sounds and shallow orthographies tend to represent the sounds that speakers are consciously aware of. They're not necessarily the surface sounds which are actually being produced because all languages have these complex phonologies with allophony and these rules and even shallow orthographies tend not to capture those necessarily, but they do capture the speaker's model. Um, and so an example of this might be Swahili versus English and French, which are deep orthographies where in order to understand the writing system, you really need to pull from the source languages, sound changes, which have happened since the writing was actually standardized, um, things like the morphophonology or things like word by word memorization. We have both shallow and orthographies in English, sort of, at least when we contrast informal versus formal writing. And so in informal writing, we might not care so much about the fact that lo and though are spelled differently. After all, they rhyme. Um, we might actually see the way that the morphophonology of the plural marker in kids is that normalized to match the way that it ends up being pronounced. Um, and we might see things like, oh, this weirdness where though and enough are spelled the same actually gets simplified out when the informal speech is written down for something like enough said. And so from this, we can kind of see the contrast between shallow and deep. And as you're thinking about creating a deep orthography in a conlang, I want to pull out three principles which create this sort of madness and complexity. The first one, don't get it right the first time. The second one, standardize. And the third, watch words drift as you refuse to let go of the past. So let's talk about not getting it right the first time. Not everything that's spoken needs to be written down. Humans are great at noise correction, and we see this already even in speech, where thanks to something that's been really extensively studied, the phoneme restoration effect, our brains can actually restore and pull out sounds that aren't actually present in the sound waves that reached our ears and make us think that we actually heard a phoneme um, because we know from the context that it should have been there. And writing can take this even further in some ways because it has the advantage that the reader can reread what's happening. Beyond that, 
Writers are really lazy. You can imagine if you're just trying to jot down a quick note during your workday, or if you're a scribe who's transcribing a really, really long text, eventually you're like, oh my God, like look at all this paper, look at all of this things I have to jot down. I'm just gonna take some shortcuts so that I can hit the beach and work less and relax more. And so this creates a tension between the reader and the writer that may be familiar in speech and understanding sound systems. We talk about ease of articulation versus ease of perception. And this exists in writing systems as well, where the writer is looking for something that's really, really easy to transcribe. The reader is looking for something that's easy to understand. And so the tension between those two can help decide where the writing system ends up settling out. An example of this in natural languages is abjads, where if you look at Aramaic really early on, we had these symbols for the consonants and the vowels, you know, we are able to write down what we need to do and have the reader understand things even without the vowel sounds. And this is something which persisted through Hebrew or Arabic. And today, modern abjads tend to have ways of representing vowel sounds through diacritics, which are optional, but they may be used pretty commonly in modern practice. But at least for hundreds of years, or in some cases, millennia, many, many texts have been written in these languages with no vowel sounds marked at all. And they are still understandable or legible or recoverable to the reader with different amounts of effort. And, you know, in the cases of um, Hebrew or Arabic, this works especially well for languages with triconsonantal roots. So a lot of the choices depend on the specific context that the writer, the language is existing in, but we see how writing systems can be successful despite being underspecified. So let's take a look at how this played out in early Zevi. One of the first things which we have already seen is that like Zevi and like the Roman alphabet had no way of representing spaces. You know, if a scribe was just transcribing Eneokeki versus Eneokeke, they just wrote down all of the symbols between them. It didn't really matter that in the reader's mental dictionary, the separation between these words happened at a different point between the phonemes. The reader was just expected to piece that together themselves. And then extending on top of this, as scribes were writing longer and longer texts and writing, writing more, these vowels, especially vowels which fell together, ended up having ligatures to make them simpler to write, um, even across words, right? Because there are no spaces to worry about. And interestingly, at least at this stage of the writing system, this actually made things more phonologically transparent in a way at the cost of lexical clarity, because even in speech, these two words um, and these examples would have been spoken as one phonological word. Um, and so, that EU, you know, even though it's separated between lexical words, it really just becomes a diphthong in speech as well. And the writing system is kind of just doing the same thing that speech does. Um, so if we take a look at all of the vowel ligatures which existed for the pairwise effect, we see, you know, there's 25 of these. A lot of them are not allowed inside of a word or inside of a morpheme more precisely, but all of these ligatures were still really commonly used because the ligatures were allowed to span words. And so a word might end in one vowel, begin in another vowel, the ligature just crossed them. And we also see um, a little bit of a view into the development of the vowel diacritics through these ligatures. You might notice that for like the points where a single E or a single I is represented, it tended to have like a little curve to it, where there were multiple of them, it was just like a straight dash line. The straight dash was the original source of them and the curve was added more to like disambiguate them where, you know, two lines on top of each other might, the length, the scribe might get a little sloppy about the length of the lines. And so it might be hard to tell which one was actually the shorter line on top, which one was the shorter line on the bottom. But in cases where that wasn't a problem because it was already easy to tell in other ways, the original just like make a quick dash is preserved. So that's um, one effect we see from this. And the other effect that we see is that, like I've said, there's 25 ligatures. Actually, that's a bit of a lie. There's 23 because two of them remain unjoined. And this isn't a coincidence. This is a particular property of U and O. So for the most part, the position of the second character in the ligature tells us about whether the sound it's representing comes first or second. But for U, the leading tail of the character always comes first. That's the property that came from just the way that the U sound was written. And for O, the trailing tail of the O always comes last. And so these two rules together created six 
ligatures or, you know, three pairs really of ligatures, which are spelt identically, even though they represent different combinations of sounds. So if we look at this third effect of keeping the tails consistent rather than the sound order, we get to see that like atu at, meaning instantly go, and atau, meaning your son, they, you know, the first three graphemes, the first three letters of those words are identical, even though the sounds that they are representing are very, very different. There, for the most part, the reader is able to recover this, for one, because when the reader consults their mental lexicon and all the possible combinations that could happen, is this saying ataut, is this saying atuat, there is, in this case, only one possibility um, for each of them, and so the reader is still able to tell what's happening. And even in cases where there might be multiple possibilities in terms of all of the possible permutations, if we think about like instantly go versus your son, just the conversational context or the reading, the context of the surrounding sentence where this would actually exist and would often act as sufficient disambiguation, right? They're likely um, syntax will even feed into this and be like, you just aren't grammatical in one case or the other. Um, another property, long vowels. So if we look at all of these examples, there are one, two, three, four, five, six long vowels, and only one of them is actually represented in the underlying writing system. And that's because Zevi has had this property for much of his history. Vowels at the end of words are always long, so there's no real need to disambiguate them in the writing system itself. Finally, as scribes are writing and writing, there were certain words, these post-position type words, soon, may, which were used all of the time. And scribes started to find ways of saying like, look, these post-position represent like spatial relations between words. Let's just put those spatial relations onto the page. And so Zevi scribes pretty early on started using these spatial abbreviations. This is something that happened, you know, not even over the course of big, big sound changes happening yet or things like that, which we'll see later, but just like one of the early ways that words were being written in a way that was not representing the phonology, but rather something else. In this case, the space in between the concept that you're conveying, whether that's under, above, in, and so forth. But there was a slight problem with this. So knowing, you know, these, these space markers originally were kind of bracketed, but knowing how much space you actually need ahead of time is really, really tricky. Um, and so, Scribes made the change where like only the first relation had both the opening and closing markers shown. Subsequent ones only had the closing markers. The opening one was kind of inferred. Works really well. That's great. Except kind of not great for the difference between soon and me. Now that we've dropped the opening marker, the difference is not actually discernible. And so scribes fixed this by modifying the form where ni is the only marker which has really three things concluded in it. So whew, phew. So we can see that there's a lot of complexity that's built up into the writing system really, really early on, and thus allowing us to get things, not get things written the first time or write them very differently than sound. From here, we move on to standardization. So as we move from individual scribes to the printing press, standards become easier to enforce. But when we're talking about enforcing standards, there's always this question of by whom? If we look at the history of English, for example, a lot of American English writing standards were formed by Noah Webster's pushes to write things in slightly different ways in his American Eng Dictionary of the English Language, published in 1806. In the UK, it was Samuel Johnson's A Dictionary of the English Language, published in 1755, which ended up being more formative. So we're familiar with a lot of these differences. We're like in the US, we often use just this OR directly from, for words coming directly from Latin, whereas in the UK or maybe many other Commonwealth countries, including Canada, which is where I grew up, we have this OUR a lot of the time representing the path through Old French. Um, but even then, it's not always there, like depending on the form that a word is extended and honorific, both uh, writing standards agree that it's just OR for a word like glamour, though there was a few cases where Americans might try to drop the U there. Generally, it always has it. In that case, glamour is because it's actually from Scots. Um, we see this as well for meter, this ER versus RE in styles which have this contrast. The measuring device itself uses ER, but the unit of measurement is an RE. And look, I mean, Americans don't count for this one because they don't even know how long a meter is. 
Um, in some American styles, we also see theater, the building being different from theater, the art form. The RE style tends to be used uniformly in the UK and not all American styles do have the RE for the art form, but sometimes that is seen. And of course, standard eyes. We see this contrast between eyes with a Z, eyes with an S. Um, and some British sources like the Oxford English Dictionary, um, the source of something called Oxford Spelling does recommend the form with a Z for strictly etymological context. So they would say realize with a Z, but analyze with an S because if you look at the etymology of these words, that's the way they came through. Um, but many British sources just use the S form consistently because like whatever. So realize with an S, analyze with an S. And then both agree that like some words which are unrelated improvised always get the Z. So taking a look at how this played out in Zevi, um, the cultural center of the ling Zevi linguosphere, that's the Bemi dialect, uh, contrasted with the administrative capital. And they both had different forms of political influence. And so when they went up against each other in terms of writing, they created this thing that I like to refer to as the great debacle of Ui and O. Giving a little initial context, Ui, exist in old Zevi, but by the middle Zevi time that the printing press was taking off and the writing standards were being formalized, um, it was not a thing. It had been replaced by OE, synchronous derivations and inflections, which would create OE were actually spoken as OE instead. Scribes used to really just vary based on personal preference um, in terms of how they represented these, how far along their particular dialects had been and the sound changes at the point that they were writing it down. But as the printing press came about, the Mathema publishing house and the Bemi dialect really started to set the direction when they made this decision. They were like, we're historians, we love history, we're going to read up on the etymology, we're going to decide whether to use OI or UI. And the government was just like, nah, we're busy, no one has time for that. But they did come up with an exception. They were like, oh, well, you know, there are certain words which have become homophones, we don't know if we really like that, so maybe we can say Zoe is spelled with a UI when it means victory, but it's spelled with an OI when it means sight. And they did something really similar for ko meaning space and go meaning circle. Um, the Mathema house was just like, look, we're historians, y'all are crazy. These words have never had a unit, no. Um, and moreover, like the Bemi speech actually had a different suffix, this UN suffix for the thing that generated ko versus ko. And so they were just like, that, that's, we don't even need to do that. So how did these things combine? Well, the cloud of the publishing houses ultimately ended up winning the battle of etymology, but through the education system, the capital was able to enforce its additional disambiguating changes and the real limiter on the ability of the education system to just like enforce its entire script view was the fact that it was still dependent on the publishing houses to generate the actual literature materials, which would be like the canonical classes that they were teaching in their schools. And so today, you know, the two dialects have paired up together to create what is known as standard written Zevi. So what is, how does that work? Well, Zevi exists in a situation of light deglossia where, you know, the two dialects remain really prominent and distinct in spoken language. They're maybe about 90% mutually intelligible. So like for the most part, they can communicate. It's not that distinct, but it's enough that like, you, you know, some adjustments are needed, but there is a single written standard used throughout the area where Zevi is spoken. And this is comparable, though not as extensive as the um, difference that we see between standard written Arabic and many of its spoken dialects in our world today. And so taking a look at some examples of this, if you're talking about fish, noi, but you write it with a UI. If you're talking about victory, as we saw the capital standard, it's UI. If you're talking about victory, OI, if you're talking about sight, Zoe is the way it's pronounced, at least at the time um, before we get into the sound changes that we'll see later. And then if you're talking about circle, this is interesting. Um, if you're talking about circle, it's pronounced with written rather with two U's, go. Um, both dialects actually ended up eventually or for specifically the word co having space being supplanted by the word which ended with an N. So, you know, ironically, this distinction, which created circle having to use was redundant, but it was formalized anyways, too late, so sad, too bad. And a few other changes, right? So other words don't have this. So the UN suffix is still written in a standard Zevi, but the Kavi dialect doesn't pronounce it in those cases. And finally, 
the two prominent dialects love to really gang up on the smaller dialects and be like, if we don't have it, we're going to ignore it. So other smaller dialects have long consonants in addition to long vowels. Standards that we're writing is like na fam. So we see how standardization played out. Finally, watch for drift as you refuse to let go of the past. So in English, the big example of this is the great vowel shift, which has created a huge difference in terms of how we write vowels and how we actually speak them. There's a few ways where this has impacted Zevi as well. The impact of historically long vowels on Zevi has been to change the way that the preceding consonant is pronounced. And so the long vowels no longer has any vowel quality distinction or vowel length distinction or anything like that, but preceding consonants are often impacted. And um, this also merges, you know, or plays in with like the impact on historically word final consonants. I've seen some level of lenition to them and that kind of differs between the dialects. And so this gives us an overall situation where if we're comparing the word for me, historically dit, you know, the Kelvi dialect says di, um, the Bemi dialect says dith, um, if you're talking about change in contrast, though, you're going to look at zi versus zi. And so both are very different from what's actually being written. So the graphemes are being written, still have it as if the vowel length is the meaningful distinction, but depending on the dialect, it's something else entirely. Um, and so we see this also affecting our sibilants as well. And we also see another letter change, which is these sound mergers. And so like, if you've noticed in this pronunciation of the COVID dialect, right, it's like weird in terms of how it matches with the spelling. Part of this is the two things we've seen. So one was that hom homophone disambiguation and the other is this sound merger, which has created an underlying spelling, which is pronounced in this way. And these sound mergers have created a bunch of new homophones as well. Kaimi, Mao, different spellings, same pronunciation. So watch words drift as you refuse to let go of the past, standardize, and don't get it right the first time. Hopefully with those, we see more of like the complex sound correspondence having played out over time in the Zevi writing system. Um, there's one more thing that I had wanted to cover, but I wasn't able to fit into my prep for talk time, which is unstressed vowel deletion. And this is also super interesting to me. It's comparable to the phenomenon of the ekadik. Um, or the ekadik rather in French, which is schwa deletion in the Hindi usage of the Devanagari script. Um, and, you know, I could probably give an entire talk about how that ends up playing out across all of those languages, but that unfortunately will have to be for another day. And so that brings me to the end of the presentation. So we've looked over these principles of deep orthographies, how to use them in a conling through the examples of how they actually applied in Zevi. And I leave you with one Easter egg of how punctuation marks play out. As you can see in this final example, as might be expected based on the way postpositions work, punctuation marks in Zevi also have this sort of bracketing structure parallel to say the inverted question marks in Spanish. So thanks. That was just another awesome talk, Kenan. Um, I, I was chatting with Sai uh, in, in our Slack chat, um, who is a, a, I'm going to say orthography uh, connoisseur. I'm not sure if Sai would describe himself as that, but uh, very, very impressed by all of the orthography talks so far. You've inspired a lot of conversation in the YouTube channel, so I, I definitely um, recommend that you do pop over to that at some point. Um, a lot of people relating or um, feeling inspired as a result of what you've shown. I know I've never put that kind of thought into one of the orthographies I've designed for a, for a conlang. I've introduced some variation that I would love to see a linguist go back and go, oh, well, when it's written A-H, it must have been this original form or A-A was this original form. And, no, it was completely by chance and <laughs> aesthetic. Um, I haven't seen any any questions come up in the YouTube chat, so I'm going to put Sai on the spot and see if Sai just happens to have a question <laughs> because I know they're they're hugely into this topic. Um, well, so for one, Joey is absolutely right. I uh, do not expect to be impressed by uh, talks on orthography. 
and uh, Cheryl and you were both amazing. Um, and I, I was very amused by the a bit on competing standardization systems. Um, I'm, I'm wondering if you have um, a thought on how the competing standardizations might uh, differ on and thereby impact uh, things like ligatures and other mm. like formal uh, forms of the writing. Um, because uh, I think this is true in Arabic. Um, there are several different sort of standard mm. Uh, formal forms of Arabic, um, and they go several different directions. Yeah, that's a fascinating thing that I would love to layer on. So I haven't layered that on at this point yet, but I do think that, um, I think that ties into two things, which is like, what, precisely like, what were some of just the different allophonic variations in the dialects even at the time and then how that might have impacted the way that they thought about the writing or even just like how my different publishing houses or how my different standards have said like, ah, oh, we like this ligature more than this other ligature. Something that I would love to just keep adding on to it as I work through this, yeah. Um, one question that popped up in the YouTube is, is uh, or are there any documents about Zevi available online somewhere where people can find them? Yeah, so I'll drop that into the chat. I don't, I plan on adding a lot of the things about the orthography itself onto um, my website. So right now I typically use just the Roman transliteration of what the underlying words would be, but I think I would love to have the like photos of all the symbols as well. I don't know if I would ever make a font for it, even though it would make things easier because it's just like, oh my God, that's so much work. But there is a ton of documentation on the um, grammar and the writing will be added to that as well. Um, I, I believe Sai has added a, a link to your website, uh, probably on the YouTube description for, for your talk. One thing I was curious about is just as someone who's con-worlding, con-langing, con what direction did you go? Did you come up with the orthography and imagine all of these changes before making words? Or did you have an idea of what the language was going to be and then evolve the orthography? Yeah, that was actually something I would have loved to talk about. And I was just like, ah, I don't have enough time. But like the history of it really has come along with me just learning more about linguistics and orthography in the first place, because it really started actually when I created Sevi as a personal language about just like my aesthetic preferences. Um, people who are on the Zompus bulletin board or the ZBB way back might have seen some of the early designs of this were like, I used to have a lot of words just ending in these like silent E's. And that was something that had been like borrowed, I think just from my context in English and French. Um, and so as I learned more about languages, generally I started being like, okay, I want to calc the languages that I know a little bit less, but I want to still have this type of like orthographic complexity because I like the general sense of it a lot. And so I started modifying it and moving it a bit further and being like, how do I create something which is a little more original in terms of why it is the way it is. Um, and so it has been this back and forth, I think from being like, this is how I want things to look aesthetically versus like, this is something which actually adds like a history or um, a, syst a systematicism to it and just like iterating from that. And I, I, I just wanna um, also leave the comment of like, this is one of the things which really resonates with me from Brian's talk to you about discovery because sometimes the way I think about this is like, you know, I'll come up with something, I'll come up with this other thing and they're like, eh, it's fine. And then like, at one point I'll feel like, oh, wait a second. It's almost like I've landed on this like relationship between these two things and now it fits together, right? And it's like, I'm learning what the actual history of it has been. So that's been fun. Thank you so much for, for sharing all that. Like I said, definitely check out the, the YouTube comments. There are a lot of people that are, are really inspired by your talk and, and your ideas. Thanks, Thanks so much, Ken. Yes, I absolutely <laughs> will.